warm welcome to session nine, uh, Future of RRI, BRRI and Policies in Times of Political Turbulence of the final conference of the New Horizon Project. Um, I'm very happy that we have so many participants here today. And my name is Susanne Meister Dragositz. I'm working at the Austrian Research Promotion Agency uh, in the Division of European and International Programs, where we are amongst other issues. Uh, also in charge of the former program science uh, with and for society that includes all uh, aspects or some aspects of our eyes such as gender ethics open science etc and i will be your moderator for the next one and a half hour so i assume you're familiar with the proceedings please mute yourself for uh, avoiding the background noises and um, you can either post your questions, if you have some, uh, in directly in the chat. And uh, I will ask you then to turn on the microphone and the video to uh, ask your question yourself. Or you can raise up your hand with this button down below. And uh, I will give you then the floor. And I was announced that I'm in presentation mode, which is quite correct. And I will change this. Moment. Thank you very much. In any case of technical issues like I had now, um, no? Okay, now, now it's a, okay, perfect. Uh, please use also the chat and um, the tech support of New Horizon will uh, help you out. And said that, I want to thank you very much, Helmut, Maria, Shauna, Pia, all the people in the background make this conference possible. Thank you very much. Um, as I want to start now, I want to uh, ask you some questions um, as a starter, so to say. Um, why do we have to talk about the future of RRI anyway? I mean, is it not just a buzzword? Uh, from what we know so far, uh, it's important is decreasing in the framework program Horizon Europe, or is it not? I mean, the fact is, it's an excellent opportunity to renegotiate the social roles and responsibilities of publicly funded research and to rethink the system as a whole. Implementing RRI means change. And as such a change process, both needs leadership and support structures. So there will be advocates for it and against it, like in any other change process. And today we are in this session looking at different uh, angles at the future of RRI, which means friends of RRI will let us join their point of views of the interaction between society and research and innovation. They will also show us the role in the RRI, of RRI in the funding program of research and innovation in Horizon Europe. And they finally will guide us through thought experiments of scientific worlds with or without RRI. So I'm pretty sure after this session, it will become very clear, RRI is going to stay in the one or the other way, if we like it or not. And said that, let's start. I'm very happy to introduce you our first speakers, Jack Sparkin and Roger Strand. Jack is an independent expert on research and innovation policy with a special interest on questions about the societal impact of research. Roger is a professor at several universities in Norway and former director of the Center of the Studies of Science and the Humanities in the University of Bern. And together, they will discuss with us the times are changing. Are they? So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, our talk is um, called The Future is in the Past. And this is a, a slogan I borrowed from a, a colleague who is a professor in the history of science in Cornell University. And he strongly believed in the idea that if you don't know your history, you are very ill prepared for the future. 
Now, currently, we are living in a time that might offer a unique opportunity to show that we can at least learn from the recent past. I'm, of course, referring to uh, the pandemic. Um, research communities and policymakers and citizen groups and entrepreneurs and, and more all over the world um, seem to engage in debates that we have to uh, do things differently in the future. And um, if we want to prevent another pandemic like this, uh, on this scale, on a global scale, or at least if we want to be able to handle it better than we are doing right now. Um, the question is, of course, how to do that. And certainly how we can avoid going back to normal as soon as we think it is possible to go back to normal. And I think we are nearing that, that point. If I see in my country, the Netherlands, uh, that everybody is, is longing to, to go back to uh, the old normal. Normal uh, meaning doing things the way we did before COVID-19 hit uh, the world. And that means forget about social distancing, uh, pick up old travel habits and, and a lot of other things. But even more importantly, I'm afraid that we will also see that a lot of urgent problems uh, are put on the back burner. Urgent problems like uh, the energy transition, like sustainability, like the carbon emission, uh, green ar uh, agriculture, and et cetera, et cetera. Because for many politicians, it seems uh, more important to, to crank up uh, production and consumption to the level uh, we had before uh, to make up for all the losses than to address um, the other issues. Now, the question is, the concept of RRI, how will it find its place in uh, this very tense situation? Will it be strong enough to make the right or to help to make the right choices? Uh, can I have the next slide? Please, yes. So this you all know, of course, the uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And in a lot of countries, you will see that they ad adhere to, to these goals in one way or another. In, in the Netherlands, for instance, uh, a number of universities have put these goals on, on the front page of their internet site. And, and if you click on it, you can see what, what different uh, departments in these universities are doing about the different goals. Um, but um, despite the fact that we know what the main goals are to focus on, you see this, this tension between what uh, politicians want and what maybe research community and other communities want uh, is, is also in these goals. If you look, for instance, at the goals number eight and nine, and number 12, so eight is a uh, decent work and uh, economic growth. Number nine is, uh, is uh, focusing on industry. It doesn't say innovative uh, industry. Well, it says industry, innovation and infrastructure actually, but it doesn't tell you much about what kind of, of innovation. And number 12 is a responsible consumption and production now how how do we uh, put these things together and I, it seems to me that given the fact that if you follow the most poli policy discussions at this moment it will be will be very uh, difficult having said that we we know that if you want to reach these goals you can only do it if we step up the collaboration between uh, researchers of uh, many different disciplines and policy makers and um, civil society and, and industry. And this wasn't easy before the pandemic, 
Uh, and I'm afraid that it's going to be maybe even more difficult after the pandemic, despite the fact that everybody seems to say at least that we need to do thing, things differently. Now, if you look at, for instance, the vaccination campaigns in countries and, and globally, I'm not so optimistic about uh, whether this will be uh, better in, in the future, this collaboration. Um, I was involved in a in, uh, medical advisory body in the Netherlands last year, and when the pandemic started, we talked to industry and, and we talked to uh, politicians and we talked to scientists, and they all promised that uh, they would uh, share the knowledge about the vaccine that we didn't have then at that moment. And that way the, the, the industry promised that they would produce the vaccine at cost. Now, of course, uh, we know now that that didn't mean so much. It's very difficult to share knowledge, apparently, and producing at cost is, is also not happening. And, and we know that uh, at the European level, the industry is, is um, backed by the politicians. And one of the consequences is that in uh, big parts of the world, less than 3% of the population is vaccinated now. And uh, I only have to refer to a country like India, which is in principle one of the biggest uh, vaccine producers in the world. But the situation there is, is really terrible. So I'm not so, so optimistic uh, about uh, whether we can uh, do things better in the future. Can I have the next uh, slide? So this is a, a poster I saw in the Paris uh, metro station, Luxembourg, in, uh, a few years ago. And if it's true that in 2050 we will have 10 billion people in the world, I would say that there is really uh, an urgency um, to do things better, to step up uh, the collaboration, not only within nations, but also uh, in, uh, at a global scale between policymakers and societal partners and uh, that we we should try to develop a future that is not only based on growth and, and jobs as, as uh, a lot of politicians in Europe still seem to think but it's also based on inclusiveness on diversity on equality on sustainability and all, all the issues that are expressed by uh, responsible research and innovation and that, that means that you, you've got to go from, from a science perspective or a research perspective, uh, invest much more in transdisciplinary collaboration, meaning collaboration between the researchers and, and all kinds of societal partners. The main question, and um, can I have the next slide? The main, the main question for me is, are we able to, to seize the moment? There is clearly uh, uh, an urgency. There is a, a, a growing need. Everybody seems to, to agree on that, to address the major societal challenges in a responsible way and together as researchers and stakeholders. There's another... Uh, another... Uh, agreement, I think, about the fact that COVID-19 and the pandemic uh, presents a perfect example. Uh, more than, it's more a health issue, everybody realizes. It's, it's also a societal issue, economic, cultural, organizational, behavioral, etc. So the conclusion can not only be that we need more vaccines and, and better medicines, and that we need uh, more knowledge about the virus, all true. But I think we also urgently need new ways to organize the vaccine production, the healthcare systems, but more in general, uh, society and production and consumption in a much more responsible way than we are doing now. So next slide, please. 
Um, it's time that we start swimming, otherwise we will sink like a stone. This is uh, in honor of Bob Dylan, who celebrated his 80th birthday uh, recently. Um, there are signs that uh, there is a, a deeper change in research and innovation culture. And interestingly enough, this is um, mainly brought to the fore by female economists. Not only female, but uh, there's a lot of female economists um, that seem to understand that instead of uh, relying on all kinds of econometric models, it's not so stupid to go uh, and do empirical work in, in, in the world, in the real world. Um, one of the first one came to the fore was Mariana Matsukato with her entrepreneurial state, making clear that uh, all the big tech companies were able to make these huge profits thanks to uh, public investments. Uh, there's Kate Rayworth who, who wrote a, a book about the donut economy, where she uh, posed the, the question whether uh, economists should pay much more attention uh, to social and environmental uh, factors. Um, there's uh, a number of other uh, people. Rebecca Henderson wrote a book about a new sort of capitalism, which should not focus only on the growth, uh, but also on sustainability, on social justice, on equality. Um, there's a very nice book by Linda Scott. It's called The Double X Economy. And she, she really pleads for a, a paradigm shift in the, in the eco economy um, where uh, researchers get out of their ivory tower and, and go into uh, the real world. She looked at uh, a number of development countries and came to very different conclusions about what uh, responsible research and, and policy is in in that respect so there is a there's a lot of uh, i could go on with a, a long list but i won't go into that now but there is a there is some light at the end of the tunnel question is whether uh, these female economists will be able to to influence uh, politics as it is developing now i am currently involved in a in a um, initiative of the Dutch Academy of Arts and Sciences that is looking at um, how to uh, crank up collaboration between different scientific disciplines and, and politicians and, and industry. Um, it's called post-pandemic plan and it, it refers to activities also taking place in other European countries and at the European level. So there are options at least to, to do things better than, than we have done in the past. Um, still, I'm debating whether we will be able to resist uh, the, the tendency to, to go back to the old normal. But maybe uh, I hand over to Roger now, uh, because he might see some, some more optimistic uh, tendencies in, in the future for uh, responsible research and innovation. Thank you very much, uh, Jack. So, uh, uh, Susanna, you, you may stop the screen uh, sharing if you wish to. Uh, so we just go, yeah, thank you. Um, so the division of labor between Jack and me is that he does the starter and the main force, and uh, uh, I try to do the dessert with uh, hopefully fresh berries, but they may be acidic, I don't know. We'll, uh, we'll find out. So I think the, uh, the, the narrative that we are, are putting forward this morning for discussion is that uh, if we zoom out and look at the bigger picture, there are actually uh, reasons for, for optimism and that support comes from unexpected corners, such as the uh, distinguished economist that Jack mentioned. And I think this is, uh, when we prepared this uh, little talk, we thought that that was perhaps 
um, a useful angle into the discussion of RRI and the concept of RRI and RRI into the future. Because sometimes, I don't know with the, the participants, but both myself and, and some of my colleagues may sometimes become a little bit pessimistic and disappointed when you follow the trajectory of one given initiative or one given concept. So if we think, think of, of RRI, perhaps it started with a, a kind of idealist, a normative uh, diagnosis, really. You know, if you go, if you think back to Rene's introduction of our, Rene von Schomburg's introduction of RRI as a as a way to correct deficiencies in the governance of science and technologies, rather idealistic, and then it becomes gradually, as it is being taken up by the institution, it becomes less and less of a cultural challenge and more and more of a sort of managerial nightmare, uh, uh, which perhaps stops at some point with funding schemes being closed down, you know, etc. And, and in a way, I think that when you focus on one such initiative, this it will often be the story that the purists will continue to fight over what is the correct definition of RRI. I think it used to be the correct definition of Marxism, but there are, have been many of these waves. And also for us, who are stakeholders in this, that it's sometimes difficult for ourselves to distinguish clearly between our own idealism and our own interests as actually stakeholders in the game. And sometimes also when we are faced with the backlashes, or, or what we perceive as backlashes, actually these backlashes are signs of institutional change. Because if we want to go from cultural to institutional change, it has mm -hmm. to work through its way through the system. And uh, speaking at a, 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 say a, a continental conference as this, organ, organized from Vienna, I believe, and uh, uh, Vienna and also the Fraunhofer, uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of actually that we could do well and just going back to the old classical discussions with Ulrich Beck and Luhmann and so from the 70s and 80s and see that what we are looking at here are problems of second modernity. We are looking at initiatives that in some way or another try to uh, help reflexive modernization and it has to go through the system, and when it goes through the system, it it will change. It will change character. Um, if it doesn't change character, it it simply will stop. So, what I think we we probably need to reflect more on is not only that the times are changing because they clearly are, but also what is our theories of change? How did we envisage that change to happen? Um, if we thought that it would be frictionless and, and without pain, I think we were naive. I would add that for us to be change agents, we also have to understand that we, if we're, get, if we're going anywhere, we need to accept loss of control and that it will become something different and we have to embrace help from the unexpected corners. So what can we do then? So on one side, we can endorse, embrace, and welcome that support, for instance, from, from the economists that Jack mentioned. Then perhaps as, as academics, as myself working at the public university, I, I guess that my role is also just to send ever new concepts into the system. So let's assume that RRI perhaps won't last forever, but that we continue to send our best ideas into the system. And then we, in a way, we have to see what, what the system will, will do uh, with it. It seems to me, and I'll stop here on a positive note, that certain things that were taboo to say are uh, speedily becoming acceptable. One thing is RRI because it you could always say RRI because most of the people didn't understand what it meant anyway. But we are now in a situation where not only Kate Rayworth can say donut economics, but an OECD high-level advisory group can publish a report that is called Beyond Growth. That, I would say, would be un unthinkable only five years ago. 
And we recently had a, a, a meeting webinar with the European Environmental Bureau and the European Environment Agency together with representatives from, from the Commission, European Commission, that indeed went into the question of thinking beyond growth or thinking beyond a purely economic concept of growth, taking this taking these challenges seriously. So, so I think we are actually in a good moment especially if we manage to think broadly and, and, and don't fall into kind of pitfall or being disappointed about uh, the trajectory of our own uh, pet, uh, pet concept, as it were. I'll stop there. And, and on behalf of Zach and me, thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, both of you, Jack and Roga. Um, we have a couple of minutes for some questions. I see a lot of hands of applause, but do I see also some virtual hands raised for questions? We had a couple of comments in the chat, like um, Esther Duflo is also a very interesting economist to follow at the moment. So she will be in the, in the line of the, those Jack already mentioned. Um, yeah. Do we have any other questions? Somebody who wants to add something or propose something? Or goes has a system. Okay. Yes, please. Michael, I see your hand. Go ahead. Hi, thank you, um, Jack and Roger, for the excellent opening remarks and kickoff. I was curious too about. Um, if you could say something, the responsibility to sort of carry some knowledge forward from these past initiatives, uh, like RRI as new language comes to the fore. And I'm thinking, for example, of um, attending a commission briefing on the new criteria for Horizon Europe and the do no harm principle now, sort of having a resurgent prominence, um, attendant with all sorts of complexities. And yet we could see parallels between RRI and those kinds of concepts, and maybe we can also offer those. Um, into the system. Hmm. Jack, do you want to? Um, I think that um, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm answering your question, but for me, uh, a main problem um, for any development of, of RRI or innovation in RRI uh, are the universities. And what I mean by that is that uh, most universities are still based on uh, more traditional cultures and traditional structures. In my optimistic uh, thoughts, I will say that they are at crossroads on the one hand, trying to compete with uh, the rest of the world uh, through publications and, and other uh, other things that we all know from the, from the evaluation culture. On the other hand, they are also under pressure to, to deal with uh, demands coming from society to be more focused on, on societal issues, to be uh, paying attention to, to all kinds of issues, issues that we uh, see in, in responsible research and innovation like uh, uh, public engagement, like uh, social inequality, like diversity, etc. Uh, but I'm afraid that most most universities uh, still are in the in the old mode, so to say, and and are afraid to to really make choices uh, to to go for uh, much more collaboration and for for much more. Uh, including, uh, let's say, RRI values in, in their policy. So it's, it's a constant uh, struggle. I know that there are uh, also more positive developments, uh, like the ones Roger referred to. So, but it's, it's a matter of, uh, as the French say, frapper toujours. You, you have to keep on knocking. And, and hope that uh, things will, will change. I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's a lot of researchers, at least from my, my uh, experience, that really want to, to change things. But 
the structures and the allocation of money, for instance, within universities is still uh, much more adhering to, to the old uh, traditional values than to, to new uh, values that could, could help us uh, address things uh, differently in, in the future. For the sake of time, perhaps I should add the comment. I don't know, Susanna, if you want to take more questions or if you want to move on. Um, or Yes, I think I would give uh, Magdalena and Anne some room for, your que for their questions. And we have one in the chat as well. I think we will continue with these three questions. And uh, I hope Michael is satisfied with um, Jack's response. So Magdalena, do you want to post your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jack and Roger, for your presentations. Um, uh, Roger, you said that um, the backlashes are a sign of institutional change. And I was wondering, because um, sometimes there is this leveling down of talking about systemic change, structural change, and then sometimes we're, I say, only talking about institutional change. So I was wondering what you think about this also in terms of like implementation and European policy or, or calls of, of New Horizon. Um, um, and the other question would be that you said the OECD, um, uh, you, you uh, explained about the beyond economic growth and that this was not think about thinkable five years ago. And when I think, for example, about ethical questions in artificial intelligence or so, then Europe is taking quite of a different stance than um, like Asia or, or, or the US. And I'm sometimes wondering, is it then Europe to take this lead again and see where, we, where we're heading for and um, that we have these ethical standards um, that are that, that we want to follow up upon and leave the other countries behind, or where is then this, um, yeah, this discrepancy between ethical standards and this economic growth other countries are heading for, or we are also under pressure under. So um, I know that we are sharp in time, so maybe you decide which questions which question you want to answer. Thank you. Should we just take the, the final one before? Is that okay or? Yes, go ahead, Roger, the final. Okay. No, no I meant that um, gets to, yes. yeah. yeah. Anna, yes, please. Yes, yes, yes. Um, thank you very much, Jack and Roger, for this uh, very nice presentation. Um, it kind of follows what uh, Magdalena's question, in a way. Uh, I was wondering, you talk about uh, the need, or rather the inevitability of uh, collapse, uh, backlash, uh, frictions uh, to arrive at some kind of change. And I was wondering, how can we as an extended RI community in a way, uh, ensure or su support those collapses and backlashes and frictions in the sense that it doesn't increase gaps between the less vulnerable and the most vulnerable broadly, <laughs> uh, in the way that it doesn't increase uh, fundamental injustice and uh, inequalities, but that it's in a way constructive or leading to something that, uh, you see, you see what I mean. So, yeah. Jack, should I have a go and answer on the behalf of both of us? I can Excellent. try that. Excellent. Yeah, I was fearing that last uh, question because I really don't have any good answer uh, to that. I think that is, um, I uh, if we were to learn from history, I uh, uh, I, I think I will give a couple of historical references that I think are interesting in this. Um, one is personal. We had a, 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 a visitor once at our university who had spent many years in a concentration camp in, in Siberia for writing a letter to the uh, Soviet Communist Party uh, explaining that they were violating human rights. Uh, and this, I was a young man when I, uh, when we had the visitor, it made a deep impression on me and, and of the value of um, keeping the message alive. 
know, even if you don't think that this will have a short ter- short term positive impact, it should not become silent. And I think that is actually a role for the RRI community. Even when we think we have zero impact, we might want to do it. The problem, as Ann says, is of course that sometimes you may have negative impact. But perhaps the the other Going through France, and we mentioned German intellectual heritage here, but of course, we could also go to France and, and remind ourselves that we have known for quite a long time that progress is not linear. With Michel said that it's the river runs through turbulence. So, but the question is, of course, as Anne poses, what kind of turbulence would be unacceptable? Um, Going even further back, personally, I would say that, but I can't control that, right? What, what I can do is that I can state in a way, I can be the knowledge reservoir as an academic. I can, I can say again and again these things that, that Michael tells us to tell the, the European Commission. And we know that uptake is not linear, but it should not become silent. And, and that, I, I think... Pretending that we can do more is is perhaps its own fallacy. Okay, thank you very much, both of you, Raga and Chuck. Um, those questions who were posted in the chat, we won't forget about them. We want um, to leave it to leave them by now, but uh, we will collect them, and if we have uh, time at the end, then they will be asked in public, or we can back to them bilaterally. So. Now I want to introduce you to my colleague, Michalis Tatanis, uh, who is working at the FFG EIP uh, as the Austrian National Contact Point, formerly known by Science Within for Society in Horizon 2020, or even CIS in uh, FP7. Uh, so he brings a year-long experience with the processes of what happens at the European Commission, and he will share now his insights about the future of RRI within Horizon Europe with us. Michalis, please start when I start sharing the... Uh, ba, 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 Maybe I start a bit e- earlier. Sorry? Maybe I start already while you're... Up, um, yes, go ahead. So. ...finding the slides. Um, yes, we are zooming in again and we're focusing now on uh, Horizon Europe. I want to discuss with you the future of uh, RRI within Horizon Europe. And if if you go to the second slide already, uh, Sue, and the extra um, pardon of opening up a uh, poll, I would like to ask you the question and answer. uh, How do you feel about the future of RRI in Horizon uh, Europe? Has it been weakened? Has is it been strengthened? Did it stay the same? Or you don't know? You rather not say me because maybe the EC is listening. So you can answer one of these options. And I see people voting. Sixty percent, more or less seventy now. So nearly everybody has voted. Should we keep it up still? Yeah. So let me make a, a, a screenshot, as I said. Uh, so nearly half of you think that uh, um, the position has been weakened. There's an optimistic 16% that say it has been strengthened. Another uh, 16% that uh, think that it stayed the same. And uh, every fifth of you, more or less, um, would rather not say or doesn't really know. Hopefully, you know a little bit more. Up, um, uh, after my presentation. So now we can go to the next slide. Uh, um, just as a caveat, I'm not an academic, so I will offer you now a, a bit more practical viewpoint of the future of RRI. And I want to start with um, how has RRI been uh, implemented in Horizon 2020? 
Uh, here we had, of course, Science Within for Society as a program, a program line that was the driver of RRI in Horizon 2020, with uh, 232 projects that have been funded in SWAFs and a total uh, of 441 million euros in EC funding that has been mobilized. That's a, a, a pretty good treat, looks like a pretty good treat. Uh, out of those uh, 232 projects, 39 were um, uh, those that had RRI really as their main uh, um, um, target. So further developing the concept of RRI, the rest were uh, projects that, uh, uh, that were in the individual keys or, or, um, or ESAs or whatever. And in the whole of Horizon 2020, outside the Science with Info Society bubble, RRI was flagged as a cross-cutting issue uh, in 171 topics. So as I said, it looks like a pretty good piece of cake, but if you go to the next slide, and if you take a look at the whole cake, um, you see that Science with Info Society, with its 232 projects, was only 0.66% of a total of more than 33,600 funded projects in the whole of Horizon 2020. And those 441 millions that were given in swaps only represent 0.7% of the total budget funded uh, under 2020, which was around 64 billion euros. And the RRI flag topics, the 171, were only 4.4% 4, 4 of uh, all the topics. So uh, it wasn't it wasn't really the big part of the uh, of the kick that we are now um, um, mourning about that we don't have in in Horizon Europe. That's the point that I wanted to make here. And in the next um, slide, I want to show that yes, Horizon Europe doesn't have a program line with a similar name like Swines with for Society. We still have the three pillars. Um, um, Lion share goes into pillar two with the with the clusters, uh, but still we have actions uh, on the uh, six um, SWAF keys or RRI keys that are funded under the program reforming and enhancing the European RNI system, which is on the fourth horizontal part of, of Horizon Europe. Um, but this um, action, this program line also includes intervention areas that are uh, not really RRI related, like uh, uh, you know monitoring of Horizon Europe and the policy support facility and stuff, stuff like that. But when you um, compare the budgets available, um, this um, program line has a budget of 438 million euros. You uh, you see that the budget that is available for RRI related projects uh, is less, considerably less, uh, in Horizon 2020, in Horizon Europe, than it was in Horizon 2020. Um, for me, a, a further complication is that this, uh, um, the program, this program line and where RRI issues and, and SWAP issues are now handled uh, belongs together with the widening part, is in a joint work program and one program committee that deals with that. And that brings, of course, uh, uh, less visibility for, uh, for the actions uh, that are perhaps related. And it's not very helpful in a political context when, because um, usually the um, people in the program committee and the commission are more interested in the 3 billion that the widening program brings with it and not the 400 million uh, uh, that the uh, swapped areas um, have. In the whole of other political uh, um, debates that are going in, that are more widening, uh, uh, concentrated, and uh, then there is no time to discuss um, seriously um, uh, RRI and Twafly. But still, we're going to have separate calls for proposals for these um, RRI swaps related topics uh, in, in the coming years. For example, in, Horizon, in the years 2021-2022, um, the destination three of this widening and enhancing um, work program will be devoted to these uh, swaps related actions. The next slide. Still, what I want to uh, show is that RRI is not uh, only swaps, it's a lot more than that. It's the six keys, 
is the involvement of multiple actors and it's also the consideration of the four principles of inclusiveness, of transparency, openness, of anticipation and of responsiveness. And I want to have a look of how Horizon Europe is doing in this respect. In the next slide, I'm offering you a quote of the only mention of the term RRI in several hundred pages of the um, regulation establishing Horizon Europe. RRI is mentioned on the recitals of this regulation, it's recital 51. And it talks about deepening the relationship between science and society. It talks about engaging and involving all societal actors. It talks about co-designing and co-creating RRI agendas and content. And it also says that it could be do so across the program through dedicated activities and in the part widening participation and connecting with the European Research Area. That's already presented. So let's see how that uh, thing um, um, divides up in the different keys, first of all. So for gender, for example, we see signs uh, that, uh, that um, uh, uh, present strengthening of gender in Horizon Europe. We see that gender equality plans are now an eligibility criterion for public bodies, research organizations, and higher education institutes. And um, if you don't have a gender equality plan, which involves a lot of points, uh, um, including the consideration of gender in um, research subjects themselves, you are not eligible to participate as a university, for example. Uh, of course, there is a um, grace period for 2021, but for calls that have a deadline in 2022, organizations need to show that they have an institutional gender uh, equality plan. Gender in, uh, uh, research and innovation content is becoming an, uh, part of the excellence criterion. You need to show, every proposal needs to show how they consider gender in their R&I content, and if they think um, that doesn't play a role, you need to justify why they think it doesn't play a role. It's not uh, um, simply ignoring it uh, um, possible anymore. And of course, gender, balance, gender balance in consortia is a, a still an evaluation uh, criteria for ex um, uh, evaluated proposals, and uh, of course, still a, a criteria in evaluation panels and in expert in the P of uh, Open Access, Open Science, we have uh, here now uh, research data management which is compulsory for all proposals, including a data management plan. And of course, there you, you can, uh, in, the, in the sense of op uh, as open as possible, as closed as necessary, uh, uh, you can define if you don't have any open data at all. But, um, at least the underpinning data of open access, uh, of peer reviewed publications need to be open access as well as the um, publication themselves. And we see here that the Commission is taking a um, um, no bullshit approach in it, uh, in the sense that they are now uh, not funding hybrid journals anymore. So they're not playing the game of the uh, publishers in um, double funding um, uh, them for open access. And we see the most important point, as I would say in this point is here, that we see a general push for open science to become a new modus operandi for uh, science and for research. We see that included in the European, uh, the new um, European research area communication, but also in Horizon uh, Europe. Um, in the area of public engagement and citizen science, we see that citizen science is now uh, perceived as a new vehicle for public engagement. It's part also of the open science practices that are demanded from all proposals. And uh, we see that public and stakeholder engagement is an important uh, factor for the societal impact of proposals in the impact criterion. So now uh, all proposals need to show that they have not only scientific and technical uh, impact, but also societal and, and um, and policy impact. And we see uh, that public engagement is seen as an indispensable um, for implementation of the Horizon Europe mission. We expect that uh, some, um, in the, uh, something in the order of 10 billion euros will be spent in the missions when they are, um, when, when they take off. And, um, you know, if you read the policy documents, but of course it's always in a matter of 
how things are, uh, are implemented at the end of the day. But if you read the policy documents, you cannot think of um, missions without public engagement and without uh, co-creation with, with stakeholders and uh, civil society. Next slide, uh, Pesu, please. Um, in the area of science education, here uh, I cannot be that optimistic. Unfortunately, this is a loser from the transition to Horizon Europe. There's a less focus in um, uh, science education than it was before. Um, also, uh, true not only for Horizon Europe, but for the new era communication also. Still, the era communication is seeking synergies with the Euro uh, between European research area and the European education area and the European higher education area. Uh, some projects will still be funded under the reforming and enhancing uh, uh, program, but as I said, uh, it doesn't look as uh, prominent um, as it was um, in Horizon on the other hand, ethics and research integrity remain strong uh, principles for Horizon Europe. There are several recitals and places in, in uh, the regulation uh, established in Horizon Europe that um, uh, so that they make the legal base that uh, everything that is funded has to be uh, ethically and research integrity is a strong principle. Um, research integrity also benefits from this push towards open science as, oper as uh, modus operandi because, of course, transparency and openness uh, are um, good signs for research integrity. Uh, ethic assessment for all proposals, that's not really a, 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 any difference. We, we still keep that. Compliance with the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity is part of this self-assessment. And ethic assessment by experts at proposal phase for those actions that raise complex or serious ethical issues. Um, eventually, uh, as in Horizon 2020, you might get uh, uh, ethic deliverables added by this ethic um, assessment to your project at the negotiation phase. And the sixth key governance, um, that's also a, a bit less of a focus in Horizon Europe. It's one of the 14 key actions of the new uh, era communication, especially uh, the Pact for Research uh, and Innovation in Europe, one of the first uh, let's say, deliverables of the new era communication. Um, is devoted to new, to new governance, um, but that's not necessarily um, under the auspices of um, RRI anymore, so to say, the debate. On the next slide, uh, from, uh, in my penultimate, um, 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 let's have a look on the four principles. So the principle of being diverse and inclusive, uh, I think that this is strengthened. The program shall promote Co-creation and co-design through engagement of citizens and civil society is the regulation asking of the whole of the program. There's a lot more interdisciplinary approaches that are uh, asked for in all proposals. So one of the um, questions that are addressed to um, in the part of methodology in the uh, in the um, uh, template of a proposal is. Um, uh, describe your interdisciplinary approaches, and if you don't take interdisciplinary approaches, explain why you think these are not appropriate. So it's more of a focus here. And of course, uh, the mission uh, demand diverse stakeholder engagement, as I already mentioned. Openness and transparency. Well, if they push for open science as a new oper modus uh, operandi, this is of course strengthened. And the societal impact is, uh, that should be tailored to the needs of stakeholders also provides um, uh, towards this principle of open science. Anticipative, we, I think we already discussed a bit in the Q&A, uh, uh, do no significant harm uh, principle, um, which is now uh, still on environmental objectives, and it needs to be addressed in proposals. Uh, and this is a mat this is for me it's a it's an uh, anticipatory method uh, explaining uh, uh, what um, uh, you expect out of your results and if they're going to have a significant harm or not on on these environmental expect um, um, objectives but is it more reflective that's a question uh, uh, to leave open for for debate regarding responsiveness and adaptiveness we see uh, signs of responsiveness with, with ad hoc calls, for example, for the COVID-19 um, that were, you know, fast, a lot more faster uh, um, uh, publishing and funding uh, uh, projects in, uh, uh, when you need to respond in crisis. Adaptive capacity of the programs, that's also a question uh, for debate. 
you know, with four-year strategic plan, uh, you don't have the flexibility, I would think, to uh, be adaptive. And of course, the adaptive capacity of projects, um, we could also debate. Topics are less prescriptive, the proposals are less detailed, so you have more time to, um, to adapt your own project um, when, when things change. So my point here is that the course is set and uh, it looks for uh, the signs are for more RRI uh, uh, being considered in all proposals. But still, the future of RRI in Horizon Europe is what we all make of it, I think. How uh, applicants will take up these uh, nudges and these signals and how they will implement it. So we might not get such a separate slice of the cake, but let's make sure that our filling layer, and it's not only the icing of the cake, it's the filling layer for me, is as big as it gets uh, when it comes to RRI. So, and we finish up, uh, Sue, with the same uh, question again. How do you feel about the future of RRI now, after this presentation? Do you feel it's weakened, strengthened, it is the same, or you don't know, you rather not say? So people are voting a lot faster now. We're at sixty percent. Please cast your votes. Yeah. So maybe we close it here. Yeah. At thirty out of thirty-six. And um, I need to find my um, the previous. Uh, uh, so we now have 37% that feel that it was uh, weakened uh, compared to 45 at the beginning, and 30% who think it strengthened compared to 16. Okay, so I can uh, have uh, um, uh, the night, the, the evening off already. So I think um, job done from my part. Okay, Michali, thank you very much. Um, maybe I stop sharing here now. Uh, I know there may be some questions now regarding to Michalis, but I had the time at my clock and I really want to give Stephanie enough room for her presentation. So I want you, for those who have questions to Michalis, note them on a paper or in your notes notes wherever and um and uh yes okay <laughs> uh and uh don't forget your questions we will if we have time and i really have hope we have then you can ask them after stephanie's presentation to michalis and i will give them their uh, a joint session for questions to michalis and stephanie and if there are any other questions to roga and check as long as we have them here um, as well. Okay, um, Stephanie, uh, I want to welcome you right now. But give me a second. I have to search for my introduction to you. Um, Stephanie, very welcome. Uh, she's a senior researcher at the Fraunhofer Institute and the coordinator of the Unit Policy for Innovation and Transformation in the Competence Center of Policy and Society. And she has a long tradition as a political scientist, as far as I could uh, uh, yeah, read out. Um, she is also a member of our New Horizon project and was a member of the Social Lab of SWAPS. So uh, she will now present us to us a quite extraordinary experiment of the Social Lab named Zooming Out to the Framework Conditions of RRI a Scenario Exercise. So Stephanie, are you ready to have those mind Thank you, Susanna, very much. Um, would you mind to share my slides, please? Yeah, well, I will Thank you for that. And thanks for the kind introduction. Yes, so I'm actually here today to speak about, um, or to speak in my role as the coordinator of the um, New Horizon Social Lab um, for, for the SWAPS program. You know, in the social labs, um, you certainly know that we, we, we worked on the specific challenges that each program line um, faced in Horizon 2020 with uh, embedding RRI or somehow approaching ideas of RRI in the program, in the calls, in the projects and so on. And then the SWAFs um, social lab participants were quite eager to somehow constructively um, 
contribute to to the debate uh, on on the future of swaths on the future of RRI. and one of the ideas was to come up and to develop uh, future scenarios um, that would help us perhaps to yeah to better communicate in the end and to to um, to um, better structure maybe also the discussion on the future of RRI. Um, so this is meant to be a provocative and an illustrative way of um, thinking about the future um, in the end to it, it shall serve to help us to understand better today um, what kind of choices we can make today what kind of I don't know, routes we can take today already um, so if you go to the next slide um, you see some of the participants of the social lab and of the workshop that we had um, when we developed the scenarios it was really a quick way of developing scenarios so we took a participatory approach we had a desk research exercise before where we really went into um, different factors that might influence um, the future of science society relations the future of ri and with that result from the desk research we presented to the participants of the workshop a couple of factors a couple of um, var variables um, that might influence ri and then the workshop um, the participants um, yeah developed for each of these factors different future different future options different ways of how that factor might unfold in the future and you see already a bit um, yeah, on the, what we had on the wall during the workshop there. And you also see what we try to do then with the factors. We try to order them, we try to prioritize them, and then to combine coherent uh, future options of the different factors together to scenarios. Um, so if you go on to the next slide. Um, yeah, we have explored um, a couple of factors. I think we started on the 16 factors. Um, and we, we looked at factors of the yeah uh, political system and other political variables and um, societal aspects, societal developments. We looked at innovation system variables and also at um, economic variables. When we um, yeah try to understand what kind of variables might <laughs> influence science society interactions and ultimately RRI. Um, and I I just sh show you now the result of what we did. If you go to next slide. Um, we um, looked at, um, after we had explored all the factors, we, we made an influence matrix where we try to understand which factor has an influence on other factors. And by way of that, we try to find out which, in, which factor is the least dependent on the other factors because such factors are perfect, fac perfect factors, perfect vari variables to start scenario development with. So, and um, what we found out in this exercise was, and in, I think you can go to the next slide because I've, it's better readable there. So the most influential factors shaping our scenarios um, were found to be the ideological stances and the political practices that would be prevalent in European Union member states and ultimately also at the European um, Union level. So um, the kind of electoral choices that we make and, and the way that the political styles and the politics that are being um, done and policies that are being decided um, will have um, enormous influence on how um, science society relations in the future will look like. And if you go on um, to the next slide, please. Yeah, here you see um, um, the four scenarios in an overview. Um, so um, we have, um, yeah, we, we, we see in those four scenarios um, um, to, to, to point it or to, yeah, to point it down to, to very um, concrete is, uh, um, yeah, uh, yeah let, me, let me phrase it differently. So what you see here is um, you see the four scenarios in an overview and um, we, we have four different political approaches, I would say, in those four scenarios. We have a participatory um, scenario in the kingdom of RRI. We have a, a liberal democracy scenario in the Fortress Europe. We have a um, populist or even autocratic um, scenario in long-lived populism. And the fourth one um, in benevolent green eurocrats is a technocratic scenario. So um, 
if we go on, I, I, I'm always struggling a bit with presenting scenarios in a presentation because normally it would take really long to talk about each of the scenarios in a way that you can somehow grasp a bit their content and uh, that it makes sense to you um, to dive into that. But I, I think we don't have really a lot of time to do that now, but I try to do it <laughs> at least a bit to give you a flavor of what is in those scenarios. Um, so the first one is called the Kingdom of RRI, the Utopia. And if I read out to you the little narrative here, um, it maybe becomes a bit uh, illustrative. And there is a longer narratives um, on the web that you can find them there. Um, so um, I think then it gets uh, even more um, understandable and also usable, hopefully. So this one is about, um, yeah, starts in Scandinavia and uh, spreads to Central Europe and to some other countries um, where we find established green parties or new political movements um, being able to present a new generation of politicians to voters. So there's a series of game-changing elections in the European Union. New governments pursue new agendas directed towards bold societal goals. For example, carbon neutral, carbon neutral mobility for all. Um, and participative processes um, are highly prevalent here, um, and they open not only participation, but also provide empowerment. And there's um, a source of appreciation, societal satisfaction, quality of life. Researchers follow agendas jointly set with citizens and accept that um, targeting societal needs is a cornerstone of excellent research. So I would say this is the most difficult scenario to achieve among those four that we present here. And you'll see already from that one, it's, the scenarios are combinations of provocative and plausible developments. Um, they are all a bit overstated in some respects. Um, I think the key here is that this scenario is so difficult to achieve because um, we need to get the empowerment right. So if, we, if actors and different stakeholders are not empowered, um, if politicians and public administrations are not empowered in this scenario, it does not work, I would say. If you go on to the next one, Susanne. This is scenario two. It's called Ford with Europe. Yes, we can. In this scenario, um, based on a dominant liberal ideology, um, the EU has started setting its priorities towards sustaining a strong economy with a sovereign technological and industrial basis. So also European integration is based on a market integration in this scenario. And the EU is a global leader in a wide range of technologies. And this includes green technologies and green products. The EU keeps its border closed in this scenario. Only young professionals and qualified migrants are allowed to come in and to work in the European Union. Um, and it's also, um, in terms of innovation, it's a quite interesting scenario because um, many, many different actors are working on technological and non-technological solutions for societal challenges. So um, there's a lot of bottom-up um, initiatives. There are a lot of different movements here, a lot of um, separate um, place-based solutions also. Um, so that's quite interesting here. Um, but there are problems as well. So there's um, social inequality within the European Union. Um, um, we might imagine that green products are maybe a luxury and only affordable to a few people. Maybe others, um, other product, products really reach a degree of diffusion where they become affordable to all, but this is not clear. And we also assume that um, a lot of, um, that global disparities would even increase in that scenario. If we go, yeah, thank you, Susanne. <laughs> so third one, um, long love populism, failed democracy. In this future, populist parties won national e elections in more and more countries in the European Union, and thus we see popular, populist and even autocratic regimes emerge. So yeah, the creed of these uh, governments is salvation and hope, so they promise stability and unity. Um, and social cohesion um, therefore exists in, in a way that large enough groups of society feel important and listen to. But there's a lot of downsides, obviously. So many, many systems, including media and the research system, innovation systems, and others are directed and controlled as um, yeah, into different degrees. So there is some sort of there's some room for interpretation in that scenario, depending on how um, you would interpret the, the governments. Uh, the character of the governments, uh, 
rather to be populist or even autocratic. So, but there, we expect a lot of direction and control here, um, and only those supported who uh, who support the regime. Um, there is some societal involvement, maybe in a tokenistic way, rather. So it, it, the involvement is rather a toolbox of the populist regime, and there is no. Um, forward-looking manner of addressing societal challenges here. It's rather addressed ad hoc and supported or building on technological solutions mainly. And it's it's hard, obviously, to find something positive in that scenario, but um, um, it seems to be highly plausible given that we already see developments in the European Union in that direction. Well, look and go. I'm saying, thank you, Susanna. If you can stay with the fourth one. Um, Benevolent green Eurocrats, <laughs> this describes a scenario, um, a state-dominated approach, a top-down approach, really um, materializing at European Union level here. Um, we imagine a technocratic process here, w which um, uh, yeah, works, <laughs> works out a societal consensus um, about the absolute priority of some sustainability missions. Um, and it's a bit open whether whether this is a, a real consensus or something that is imposed upon, that depends also a bit on how benevolent we, we imagine the, this um, government to be. Um, but um, we, we think that um, uh, they, they are enlightened in a way that they really want to efficiently and quickly generate rational solutions for all the societal challenges and that are out there. And, um, there's a lot of investment and communication in this scenario. So there's um, political communication, which engages people around a shared narrative about the collective goals, U European Union missions. Um, and there's a lot of top-down regulation steering for um, activities needed to achieve those missions, including research and technological development and innovation. Um, so, we see a lot of innovation taking place and that also including um, this, um, social innovation, but it's rather um, centralized solutions. So we wouldn't really expect here place-based solutions, for example. Thank you for that, Susanne. So the question is what do we want to do with these scenarios? It's not only that we present them, but we would also like to give some ideas uh, for everybody who wants to use these scenarios and work with them. Obviously, you can ask yourself first whether you, you think they are plausible or whether you would imagine that there are really different outcomes um, on the horizon. Um, and this is an interesting question as such, obviously, um, all the more as we didn't have the time in, in this um, uh, exercise to, to really uh, involve many, many people. And um, this is, could be one, uh, one step to go further with the scenarios. What I'd like to show you now is to... Um, to take the step to um, ask, and what does this mean for our eye? Um, and what does it mean for us, basically? So if we, um, if we look a bit further into, into the yeah, ways, thank you, Susanne, how we can use this, we might think about analysis that we do or workshops that we um, ha um, hold um, where we can ask, for example, the following questions. So what would be the purpose of RRI in these scenarios? Um, would RI be an approach to intervene in the early stages of the emergence of te new technologies? For example, a bit going back to the origins of RI. Is it an approach to calm down the public and make them trust in science? So um, an approach that um, we certainly would not like to see, but um, which is a realistic way to think about um, purposes of RI as well. Um, what we see more ambitious um, purposes, um, for example, the establishment of a trustworthy governance for our TDI activities um, connected with our activities. Um, would research and innovation profit from the diversity of society in the, in the scenarios? So are they inclusive and would they contribute to just transitions? So this really already refers to um, also to Horizon Europe and the Green Deal. Um, and also obviously would RRI um, contribute to um, to to contributing to, or to working on transformative change and on solutions um, addressing grand global challenges, as has been discussed also by Jack and um, Roger in the in the first presentation. Um, so, if you um, yeah, this is just one example. Um, if you 
if, if you go a bit into the scenarios, you realize that um, in inclusion pro problems with inclusion might um, appear in, in some of the scenarios so of benevolent green bureaucrats and also the kingdom of RRI might really lead to elitist participation if we don't really empower the people um, how to do uh, participation, how to do co-creation. Um, and Fortress Europe obviously leads to a lot of global injustices and also in the populist scenario, we don't know whether social cohesion really is there or whether it's just superficial. Um, and um, if you go on to the next slide, Susanna, here are a few ideas and questions. This is closely linked to the, to the question on, on the purpose of RRI um, and now comes to the instrument level. So what kind of instruments would we find actually in the scenarios to embed RRI? Would we find today's RRI instruments, um, and I'm referring to the keys here, um, but um, actually there are many other instruments already in place today um, to opera operationalize RRI, for example, um, the area framework um, of the British Research Councils and um, also other um, ways to, to look at RRI and to operationalize it. So would we find those uh, in the scenarios and how? And would they serve to foster meaningful science society interactions? Would there be other instruments or would some of the instruments be really dominant and important? And which instruments could serve to mitigate unfavorable developments in these scenarios? These are all questions that we could ask. And there's, again, um, two examples that I'd like to share. And maybe we go just to the second one, Susanne. So you hop over the next slide and yeah, just go here. So um, interestingly, because Michal has already said, or just said that science education is a bit forgotten in Horizon Europe, when we look at the scenarios, we realize that science education might become very important actually because it, it, is, it could be an, an important tool to empower different actors um, for working together. And in some scenarios, we also realize that it might become an ideological tool to somehow, um, yeah, um, somehow embed new narratives in society. Um, so this is really an interesting uh, way to think about science education and about the importance of it. This is um, one example from an analysis, a little analysis that we did on the scenarios ourselves. And I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and finally, there is another way to think about the scenarios and to use them. And that is uh, what I had under the headline of strategies. Um, it's it's um, as such that the future is not given out there and thus um, it cannot be predicted, right? Um, it can be shaped by today's action and that's what all the, what the scenarios are basically about. So they, would, they are really building on actions that we take today as voters, as politicians, and as um, members of society and as in, 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 as also in our roles in research and innovation. So um, we could use the scenarios um, for self-reflection and also for organizational development. And we could ask what role, what would be the role of researchers, industry, innovators, civil society in those scenarios? Who would fund and support RRI or any successor concept there? And also have a look at your own organization and the strategy and consider how well it shapes up in each scenario. And what would, would it mean for you to act responsibly in each of these futures? And what could be a role in any of the scenarios? So this is a bit a different take, but also the scenarios um, are there, are containers there that could also be used for that kind of reflection. And um, I think we can move to the last slide, a little summary. So we found that the most important framework condition for the future of RI seems to be how ideological stances and political practices develop in EU member states and at EU level. And then um, we have uh, thought about yeah, how, how to work with these scenarios, how, what to offer to you and to everybody who wants to work with the scenarios. And the first aspect could be to discuss the purpose of RRI and um, policy instruments in these different futures. And then to backcast in order to identify issues which already today need our attention and that of the policymakers. And further, um, this is the idea, um, of own strategy development so, and of, of our role as citizens also. So our electoral decisions matter and also our actor strategies matter and need to be checked whether they are future proof. 
So um, that's it for the moment. This has been a really a quick ride. There is more material um, on the scenarios in on the website already of New Horizon, and there's more to come. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Stephanie. It was uh, quite a lot and um, good food for thought, as Joshua already in the and in other connection. But um, anyway, for thoughts and in regards of future future of our eye. And as I promised now, uh, I want to thank first all speakers here uh, that they have. Uh, spared their time with us and are still available for the next um, seven minutes. Probably I ask the permission to prolong the session for three or five minutes more. So we have 10 minutes for the questions to Stephanie and to Charles. And I already see Jack has raised his hand and please go ahead and ask a question, Jack. Yes, thank you, Suzanne, and thank you, Stephanie, for uh, your presentation and all the scenarios. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I, I miss one scenario, and that's the guerrilla scenario. And what I mean by that is that, uh, going back to the presentation of Roger and me, uh, there, are, there are all kind of um, instances, moments, uh, initiatives, that uh, can help us realize uh, RRI or at least some of the, the elements. And I'll give two examples. Uh, there is an initiative at the European level called the New European Universities. These are 17 consortia of, of European universities. And they focus on um, what I call the next uh, generation, so young researchers. Uh, at the at the end of their studies or at the beginning of their uh, research career and uh, what they try to do is to develop uh, collaboration between these young researchers and uh, and stakeholders in in society so a completely new way of of dealing with uh, the relation between uh, universities and the, and the surrounding society and the, and the problems that are there. Um, it's, it would be really interesting to look into that and it gives a, a, a unique opportunity, I think, to, to uh, realize some of the things that we as the RRI community all want to, to realize. And then another thing is that uh, in, um, in the national evaluation system of the Netherlands and, and probably of some other countries too, uh, we now have included a number of the RRI key uh, criteria, like for instance, uh, gender equality, uh, ethics and integrity, diversity, uh, public engagement, and it it would be good to to look at uh, different evaluation systems not only at the national level for universities but also in the in the research councils because they in the end decide about how uh, the money for research is allocated and if they uh, include these rri values that would be would be very helpful but so what I mean to say is that there are opportunities to, to uh, seize the moment and, and to uh, further the cause of RRI, but we just have to, to grab them. Okay, thank you, Jack. Um, I think Roga has raised his hands. So, floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. I will make a, a somewhat similar comment, I think. I, I'm struck of how nicely the three talks uh, uh, place themselves together. Uh, this clearly work done by the organizers. So I think we, we started out by a sort of macro perspective, perhaps, with Jack and me, and, and got Michalis to, to go into what's the state of play. And, and I think that Stephanie did a tremendous job afterwards of showing what is at stake and maybe be at stake in the state of play in in the future and i i think this i i really appreciated the way that you go into this and 
kind of not keeping the why of RRI constant, but sort of going into the how of RRI and then rediscovering the micropolitics in the RRI practices when we see them under different scenarios. And I think that this is also something that we need to do and, and that we are doing, right? That, that if you look at some of these RRI projects uh, uh, that go into the question of how to evaluate RRI, how to do indicators, how to do metrics, etc., many of these discussions about what do you mean by science education, you know, what, what kind of ideological flavor does that key of science education really have? I'm, I'm trying to do that, to, to acknowledge and work with the micropolitics of, of these things. I think that is also uh, important and, and, and worthwhile. I, I would also say that I think what we are showing here is that it's possible to have a kind of fresh discussion around these issues. And I think this is actually pertinent to say, especially within an academic setting as this one. I've been struck again. I think during the Stalin era in the Soviet Union, you shouldn't be the first one to stop clapping, right? Because then you would be sent to Siberia. But you shouldn't be the last one either, because then you proved it, that you were an idiot. And, and what strikes me is that, especially university academics as myself, the, with the ease that we tend to place ourselves into the very middle of the policy discourse many times and not showing any sign of resistance towards these kind of uh, policy messages that you know were constructed in a certain context in Brussels or elsewhere and, and with the people who constructed them knew about the ambiguities. And still you get the university academics to run after the RRI money or the circular economy money or whatever. So if we can show more of that resistance, that I think would be a good idea. And that would probably be the guerrilla, part of the guerrilla scenario. Okay, thank you for that statement, Roger. <laughs> I mean, and I, I really have to say, Stephanie, I liked the drawings of your scenarios. It's like they were comic-like and sketchy. It was very brilliant to have it in one picture that had really many um, thoughts behind. And it was, um, yeah, I found it really yeah, enlightening, so to say, the drawings. Okay, there we have any couple more questions? No? Um, yes. Well, then I have the pleasure to close this session right on time. And once again, I want to thank uh, all speakers for the presentations, um, for the discussion, input, food for thoughts. And thank you for participating in this session. Don't miss the next session of the New Horizon Final Conference on RRI and Institutional Change this afternoon at 2 p.m. And then I'm left to say goodbye, have a good day. Thank you very much for joining us.